Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, virtual Saskatchewan effective speaking competition. Uh, my name is Jay Shaw. I'm a former Air Cadet and a current director with the Saskatchewan Air Cadet League. Uh, and I actually participated previously in the effective speaking competition, uh, representing Saskatchewan at the national level twice, just a few years ago. Um, in the zone competitions, which were yesterday and today, we have 13 cadets participating. Um, we had six of those cadets participating yesterday, and we have the remaining seven participating today. And the top three from each day, so yesterday and today, will move on to the provincial competition next Saturday. Uh, before we start, I just have a few housekeeping rules to go through. Uh, so first of all, out of respect to the speakers, judges, and the audience, uh, we ask that you remain muted during this competition. Uh, number two, I'd like to remind you that uh, to please note, uh, to not take uh, photographs or screenshots during this competition. Uh, we're recording the whole thing and it'll be posted on our Saskatchewan Air Cadet League Facebook page. Uh, at the end of the competition, we'll have a few chances to take some screenshots if you wish. Uh, for parents, please decide prior to the speech beginning if you'd like your video on or off. Once the speeches begin, uh, please do not switch. Uh, for those entering late, uh, for any reason, so if you need to leave the Zoom meeting, I need to rejoin. Uh, you might be waiting a few minutes because we will only be allowing members to join between speeches instead of during speeches. And lastly, for parents and visitors, uh, if you could please rename yourself with a V, I can see that most people have done that. And that's just so we can alphabetically sort everyone so we know uh, who is who. So just a V in front of your name on Zoom. Now I'll just go through this competition format just so there's no surprises. I think most of you know. Uh, all about the format already, but we'll just quickly go through it. So this competition will have two speeches. The first will be a prepared speech, and then there will be an impromptu speech. The prepared speech will be five to six minutes long. Then we'll have a about 10 minute intermission. And then the impromptu speeches will start, which will be three minutes to prepare, and then a two to three minute speech afterwards. The speakers will not know the topic of the speech until they're given their three minute preparation time. So the cadets who have not started their impromptu uh, speech yet will be separated from this main meeting. So they do not know the topic beforehand. Uh, between speeches, we'll have about a two to three minute break to give the judges a few minutes to mark. And the order of the cadets that are presenting uh, has already been decided. It corresponds to the speaker number. And for the impromptu speeches, it'll be reversed. So the speaker number will stay and correspond to the same cadet but speaker number seven will start first for the impromptu speeches. And after the speeches are completed, at the end, we'll tally the scores, we'll announce the top three names, and those three cadets will continue on to provincials on April 24th, which is next Saturday on Zoom. And then the winner of that competition competes at nationals on June 5th, which is also on Zoom. So any questions or anything from any cadets or judges or parents? Uh, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself, but if you have a question, just raise your hand. You can use the raise hand icon or just send me a chat message. Okay, seeing none. So now we can start with the prepared portion of this competition. And what we'll do is we'll separate the speakers from this main meeting room. We'll uh, send them to a breakout room, and then one at a time, uh, starting from speaker one, they'll join this main session, and we can start the prepared speeches. Okay, speaker one, are you ready? You're just on mute. No. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we have speaker one. Topic is, what does diversity mean to you? What does diversity mean to you? Speaker one, you can go anytime. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have a question for you. What is diversity? Does it even matter? Has it ever brought change? Or did it just cover up the truth? Let's define it. The definition is, 
The practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders, sexual orientations, etc. The simpler version is that diversity refers to the ver existence of variations of different characteristics in a group of people. These characteristics could be anything that make us unique such as our cognitive skills and personality traits, along with the things that shape our identity, like our race, age, religion, and cultural background. In our everyday life, most places that you look to will have diversity, but is this truly diversity or is it discrimination? When it comes to daily life, most of our day is spent outside in either work or school or some other activity. However, in our current situation with the pandemic, working from home is the new normal. This might not include interacting physically with others, but here is where the role of diversity is truly implemented. In a workplace, bias and discriminative practices may go unnoticed by most, but when it comes to working from a screen, it will be pointed out. The question is why? Diversity means to include all sorts of people and things, to make the differences stand out and be accepted, right? So when looking at it from a distance, the misconceptions start to stand out. One of them is how the meaning of the word itself can be misinterpreted. One big chunk of diversity includes equality, but some people forget altogether that it even has equality as a huge part of it. This can lead to diversity being turned into discrimination unknowingly. Not only does this lead to possible workplace problems, but it could also cause misunderstandings to occur more frequently. This could worsen the scenario instead of helping better it, which was supposedly the original effect. However, sometimes the problem turns out to be about the willingness of the person themselves. People are brought up in different households with different teachings. And when it comes to school, this problem is the most frequent. Children are bullied and pointed out for being who they are. They aren't accepted. This leads them to either changing themselves to fit in, continuously being bullied, or losing their self-esteem and self-confidence. Neither of these outcomes are positive, and they definitely won't help lead to a better future. These children could grow up to hate others for who they are, and the cycle would keep on repeating itself. Another problem that could occur is exclusion. At first, it might seem like something that's not possible in a workplace or even at a school. Fun fact, it is. At schools, it's very common for children to be excluded from groups and friendships because of the ignored rule of diversity. But when it comes to workplaces, it's a little harder to spot. But upon closer investigation, you can learn that it is still there. Take promotions, for example. When it comes to being promoted, discrimination and bias play a huge role. Let's say that a black person was to be promoted before someone white. The bias might be able to find its way to make sure that the white person got promoted instead. Taking all of this into consideration, my meaning of diversity is to truly accept anyone and everyone for who they are. Because once you accept, the rest will gradually follow then you will be able to let go of any bias, racism, or discrimination that you have. And this will help you make decisions that benefit the whole. And you will be able to focus your attention to all of what is happening, be it at work, school, or any other place that you will meet and interact with others. It doesn't matter. The rule applies everywhere. Whatever your definition of diversity may be, remember what Malcolm Forbes once said. Diversity is the art of thinking independently together. Thanks, Speaker One. Now we'll just give the judges a few minutes until we ask Speaker Two, two to come in. And Speaker One, you can stay in this room and listen to the rest of the speeches. All right. Okay, Speaker Two, are you ready? Yes. 
Okay, so now we have speaker two. What I have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. What I have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Speaker two. For better or worse, like so many others, I have been zooming through life during COVID-19. And as a result, I've seen and I've learned a lot. Good afternoon to the judges, guests, and fellow cadets. I'm speaker two, by Sergeant Han from 34 Lulun J Guru. During this COVID pandemic, the world has changed so much that it, it is unbalanced. How have we managed to create a world that is so confused and unstable? Surely it is not just about COVID-19. In this COVID pandemic, every country is going through a tough time. No one has been spared. Societies in every country are not balanced. Perhaps the hierarchies created over millennia are the main point. Since many people with power and money have more opportunities, especially now. In this situation, people in developed richer countries have a better chance to survive since they can receive and afford better health care. That makes the society unstable. In these countries, people are arguing about which vaccine is the best to get, instead of wondering if they will ever get a vaccine. Some schools manage to stay open, while others must close due to poor ventilation or high air risk populations. In addition, access to technology is very uneven, creating an education system that favors the haves over the have-nots. As a result, the children who have the opportunity to take e-school will be less likely to contract the virus because they don't have to deal with interaction with other students in crowded hallways and teachers who might have not had the vaccine. Another challenge is that not everyone agrees that COVID is a problem. Many refuse to change their daily routine, wear masks, keep the distance, and even more problematic, refuse vaccines. This including parts of the media do not believe the government and the scientists or the doctors who are involved with the COVID. Vaccines has been released and used this year. Consequently, many people are also skeptical about the vaccine and do not believe the vaccine is going to work. Another issue is that after taking the vaccine, people may assume that they are immune to the virus, so they go out and continue with the human interaction, continuing the spread. People need to realize that their lives and the lives of the others are really in their hands, and that acting selfishly and arrogantly will only make the situation worse, more unbalanced. The virus has hit us really hard. The reason is simpler than everyone wants to admit. We did not prepare for something like this. In cadets, we use a whole week to prepare ourselves for the day that we go to cadet each week. These activities include polishing boots, our uniforms, and sewing on the badges and the words earned from cadets. In the same manner, we can prepare for the next situation just like this one. If we don't get our act together, far too many people are going to die or become disabled unnecessarily. In cadets, if we do not prepare the parade, our squadron, just like the society, will pay the price. Wave after wave COVID continues. We're still not prepared for that. And the main reason is still that people were not working together from top to bottom. In the second wave, we did not even have the right equipment and the method to keep the virus in control. Just imagine if we sent our soldiers to defend democracy and they had no right equipment to protect themselves with. And now it is a race, which will win, the vaccination rate or the variants. We here we now have the third wave. It reminds me of a story about the war on the beaches, when wave after wave of troops went ashore to overwhelm the enemy, except now the enemy is the virus trying to overwhelm us. We need to have the best line of defense, and that involves much more than just vaccines. So what is the best advice? Not surprisingly, it is was said at the beginning of the outbreak and during the 1918 Spanish flu and for the so-called chicken flu, cleanness is next to the godliness. Cleanness is the best weapon against COVID. We can wear masks and use alcohol to clean our hands when we enter or exit from a place. We must social distance and follow gathering guidelines. Furthermore, just like in cadets, we need consistent leadership that commands and deserves respect and compliance. 
We are very much in a war of a kind none of us has been involved with before. As cadets, we have the opportunity to lead by example, to engage with fellow young people as we support and encourage them to toe the line and feel great about their contribution and efforts. As a society, we have seen the tragic loss when we break ranks and refuse or won't march in lockstep with our shoulders straight and our eyes forward. Let's continue to learn, to serve, and to advance, not only as cadet, but as a society as a whole. Good afternoon to the judges, guests, and fellow cadets. I'm Flight Sergeant Han, and this is what I've learned during COVID-19. Okay, thanks, speaker number two. Thank you. You can stay in this meeting and listen to the remaining speeches, and we'll give a few minutes to the judges. Okay, speaker number three, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, speaker number three, what are the greatest <coughs> challenges facing the aviation industry today? What are the greatest challenges facing the aviation industry today? Speaker number three. In 1903, when the Wright brothers launched the first airplanes, no one in the world expected the aviation industry to be what it is today. When humans first started traveling, it was by foot. Eventually, horse carts and bull carts were used as the main source of transportation. If we fast forward to centuries later, now we have cars, trains, bullet trains, ships, and one of the most revolutionary transportations of all, aviation. When most people think of aviation today, they think of travel and vacations, but it's much more than that. Aviation brings international trade, job opportunities, and economic growth. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, judges, parents, and fellow cadets. I'm Flight Corporal Parthi Shaw, and today I'll be talking about the challenges facing the aviation industry. Before talking about the concerns, let's talk about the positives so we know why the industry exists. Airplanes are the best mode of transportation to travel extremely far distances because it takes much less time compared to driving. For a lot of places, driving isn't even possible. Planes are also a very large way to transport items such as retail goods, medical supplies such as the COVID vaccine, mail, and food. An example are fruits. When we walk inside a grocery store, we have the privilege to see foods that are not local. Examples are avocados from Mexico, grapes from Chile, and mangoes from India. These fruits are grown, hand-picked, packaged, and imported to Canada. All of this is only possible because of aviation. This travel is needed for both business and personal enjoyment. Lots of companies do business with many different countries all around the world, and aviation allows them to fly efficiently, safely, and securely. Flying for vacations helps the tourism industry. By increasing tourism to countries and regions, air transport helps generate economic growth, provide opportunities for employment, and increase revenues from taxes. With all these positive effects of aviation, let's look at the main challenges that are facing it. The first one, which we all know, is COVID, which is directly impacting the airline's ability to make profit and stay in business. In a normal year, airlines have a profit margin of 3.1%, which is very low compared to other industries like Canadian Tire or Tim Hortons. Because the cost to run an airline is so high, the main expenses are maintenance, salaries, and fuel. Against our beliefs, airlines' profit is very low. Even in a normal year, running an airline is not easy, and many airlines have gone bankrupt. Since the past year, these problems have gone much more worse. Because of COVID, less people are flying on less flights than, than any other time in the decade. Since less people are flying on less flights, airlines are now making less revenue. Along with this, some airlines are keeping an empty seat between passengers. Now, flights are making half the revenue per flight than usual. COVID will go away one day, 
but it will leave a long-term effect on the aviation industry. Now, businesses are used to having conference calls and other technology facilities that make it possible and normal to talk with clients virtually rather than flying to meet them. Once COVID is gone, there, there will be a drastic difference between passengers traveling for business. Business travelers make up 12% of the total passengers on board, but they make 75% of the profit on each flight. So, airlines need business travelers to occupy business class and first class seats. And they fear that they'll lose such elite passengers forever. Since the past decade, another interesting challenge in the aviation industry has been a pilot shortage. Pilot, uh, pilots have to get their commercial pilot license. And once they get it, they have to work as flight instructors at regional airlines, which are not as well-paying jobs as national airlines, such as Air Canada or WestJet. So the hard work and expense only pays off once you have a job at a main airline. Along with this, Pilots have to deal with other struggles as well, such as irregular schedule, spending time away from family, missing important family events, and one of the main ones of all, which is the stress of hundreds of lives in your own hands. When we go for a trip, we need to arrive to the airport around two to three hours in advance. This is so we can get your luggage checked in and pass security. The reason for such tight security is terrorism. Terrorism is an important challenge the aviation industry cannot ignore because no one wants an event similar to 9-11. In conclusion, the aviation industry has given us opportunities to travel the world, get supplies such as mail, food, parcels, etc., and even make it possible to land on the moon. But there are some concerns such as pilot shortage, COVID, cost, and terrorism that we need to try to solve. Thank you, speaker three. You can stay in this meeting and watch the remaining speeches and we'll give the judges a few minutes. Speaker four, are you ready? Could I just have a second to uh, pin the timekeeper, please? Sure, yeah. Perfect. Okay, speaker four, topic is what I've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. What I've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, speaker four. I spent weeks around my laptop waiting for news. It came finally on a Monday and it came the way everything comes these days. A text message, grades were posted. I knew all my other marks. I had never failed a course, so how bad could it be? Statics, that's how bad. Good afternoon, honorable judges, officers, cadets, and guests. I am Warren Officer First Class Catherine Batani with 542 Foam Lake. What have I learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Many things, like how to sanitize my groceries. Yet the most important lesson has been remaining in motion during a pandemic that seems to freeze time. Because of COVID-19, my first year of engineering has been completely online. Our lectures are pre-recorded videos and textbook pages. Although we are safe behind our screens, we are isolated because of them. I can't ask questions to others in a lecture or study in the library with friends. Engineering takes pride in unity but we don't know how to react when we are divided by distance. Statics is a required engineering course and is part of mechanics that uses bodies at rest and forces in equilibrium. So basically, it's about things not moving, being static. Coincidentally, this COVID year has been nothing but a standstill. I spent many late nights trying to understand what to do with one single question. Many of my assignments came back with 50s, 40s, and the occasional zero. But I still didn't stop. I pushed myself to ask questions. The final exam day crept up, designed to take five hours, but with a limit of three. And when the time was up, I grasped onto my last bit of hope and hugged my mom and cried. So I spent three weeks waiting for news. 
Finally, grades are posted. I had never failed a course until right now. A soul-crushing 43. We learn in grade school that failure is this key to success. But have you ever had to sit in the pieces of your mistake? It doesn't feel like an achievement. At the time, I wanted to freeze, but I had to continue on. I spoke to friends, family, and neighbors. I learned it wasn't uncommon to fail. I felt relief. I took statics again this semester. It was a challenge with more late nights. I finished in March. I sat perfectly still as the loading dots spun around, fetching my grades. All my frustration had come down to this. My student page, and at the very bottom, statics. My finish line was finally there, finally in sight. Statics, D minus, I passed. <laughs> I made it, but with a 52. It's not a good mark. I thought, did it even matter? It took me a while to accept, but I've realized that it does matter, and it matters very much. We're often faced with disasters, frustrations, like a pandemic, but it is always our choice how we react. I'm proud I made progress forward. I've decided to try something different from engineering. Although I passed, I don't think it was worth it. Those stressful days and sleepless nights took their toll on my mental health, and I'd rather do something challenging and enjoyable. It taught me I am strong, and I'm following a new passion with plans to one day work in a library. I was just accepted into my new program. I love books. I'm excited to share my love of literature and storytelling with others. I'm so excited. This is my progress forward. So what have I learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? That I never considered myself an overly social person. But when I spent a lot of time isolated by distance, I realized having people who understand what I'm going through is very valuable to me. Engineering is hard, a program where togetherness propels students forward, but we lost that due to COVID-19, which made a very difficult program that much harder. Finally, I learned to not be static. The pandemic has forced me to be stuck in many ways, at home, without fellow students, but I found to look for ways to be mobile, even with restrictions. It has taught me I am resilient. All of these challenges will soon fade, but one thing won't. When I told my mom I had passed, she said, I'm proud of you. That was really good. And when I knew that I was proud of me, I made it. And now I'm on to something different. Thanks, Speaker Four. You can stay in this main meeting room and watch the remaining three speeches. Uh, and we'll just give the judges a few minutes. Speaker five, are you ready? Um, I guess so. Okay, uh, speaker number five. Topic is describe a Canadian hero and the impact they made or are making on our society. Describe a Canadian hero and the impact they made or are making on our society. Speaker number five, you can go anytime. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There is one person that millions of people can thank, especially in the diabetic community. Diabetes has also affected loved ones such as my grandma, as it was him and his partner, Charles Best, and other associates who discovered a treatment for diabetes, which we now call insulin. This would be Sir Frederick Banting. What is insulin, you may be asking yourself. Well, insulin controls the metabolism sugar. It's a hormone made in your pancreas. After a meal or snack, the di digestive tract breaks down the carbohydrates and changes them into glucose. Without insulin, a diabetic would have roughly two years left to live. Diabetes was basically a death sentence back then. Frederick Banting was born November 14, 1891, on a small for farm by the town of Alliston, which is near Toronto. His father was a farmer and wanted his children to get a good education. 
Frederick attended local schools and his teachers described him as a hardworking, shy, and a serious student. While he was in school, he had, attended, he had a classmate who was diagnosed with diabetes, who ended up sadly passing away due to there being no treatment available, which affected him deeply. It pushed him as a young person to make a difference, to find a way to help diabetic people. He enrolled in the general arts program at Victoria College, part of the University of Toronto, when he was 19 years old. He had failed all his courses and was about to repeat the year when he discovered that he could drop out of the general arts and enroll into the Faculty of Medicine instead. He graduated in 1916 because of the urgent need for doctors in the First World War. While he was a student, he had enlisted into the Canadian Army Medical Corps. With graduation, the corps had sent him abroad. Or aboard, sorry. He served two years in the military. When he came back, he was awarded the Military Cross for his valor under fire. In 1919, at the end of the war, age 29, he continued, he wanted to continue to help others. At the time, he had little knowledge on diabetes or the pancreas. Banting had fled London, Ontario and staked his marriage savings on the study in Toronto. However, he and Bess did have some success treating some symptoms of diabetic dogs. Based on those findings, McLeod authorized further testing and the extension of the research team. The Toronto trials resulted in the discovery of insulin in the winter of 1921 to 22. On May 3rd, 1922, the discovery was declared in Washington, DC. Bantine, Best, McLeod, James B. Kolob, and three others were on the study staff at the time. In addition to his general practice, he taught part-time orthopedics at the Western, sorry, at the University of Western Toronto, Ontario in London, Canada from 19, 1920 to 1921 and lectured in pharmacology at the University of Toronto from 1921 to 1922. He earned his MD degree as well as his, as well as, sorry, he earned his MD degree as well as a gold medal in 1922. In addition to his medical degree, Banting earned the LLD and the DSC degrees in 1923. Prior to receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in far, so, sorry, psychical, so, psychology or medicine in 1923, which he shared with Best, he was awarded the University of Toronto's Reeve Prize, 1922. In 1923, the Canadian Parliament awarded him a, sorry, 7,500th life annuity. Best, er, sorry, Banting delivered the Cameron Lecture in Edinburgh in 1928. He was elected to various, med, sorry, he was elected to various medical academies and societies, both in his home, home country and overseas, including the British and American psychological sorry, psychology studies, as well as the American pharm pharmacology studies, Banting remains the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in pharm psycho psychology or medicine, age 32 at the time he won the award. In 1934, he was knighted by King George V. When World War II broke out, he acted as a lineson officer between the British and North American Emergency Services, and was sad. And sadly, he was killed in an air crash in Newfoundland in February 1941. His legacy lives on to this day. About 422 million people have diabetes, and just to think, without his discovery, those 422 million people would have such a limited time here on Earth. It would not get to experience a fun all the all the fun adventurous things that others do. Sir Frederick Banting was truly a Canadian hero. Thanks, Speaker Five. You can remain in this main meeting room and watch the remaining two speeches, and we'll give the few, judges a few minutes to mark. 
Speaker number six, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, speaker six, topic is, what have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? What have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Speaker six. A whirlwind of negativity engulfs 2020. When the unexpected arises, we as humans tend to quickly panic, throwing blame and projecting our own guilt onto others. But personally, I find that change, while difficult, is just a testament that I have to strive to overcome on my own. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Flight Sergeant Kwan, and today I'll be sharing what I've discovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. To start off, I was given this time as an opportunity to rest, heal, and start from scratch. As a person who is involved in countless extracurricular activities, I learned that taking a break for myself was essential to growing into a strong, stable, independent woman during a time full with such uncertainty. I grieved for everything that was gone, but also found new things every day that made these unusual times worth living. Filling my days with my family and activities like long nature walks, playing music and running have made this lonely life endurable. I learned not to worry about things I can't control and to spend effort on things I can actually do, contribute to, or influence. I learned that in the midst of a pandemic, there are ways to connect and make an impact in the community. COVID-19 surprisingly had ignited my passion into a reality with the mindset of, if not now, then when? Initially being afraid to start a project completely on my own was just a testament that I have to get out of my comfort zone to positively impact my community in a time like this. As a passionate musician playing five different instruments, I noticed the lack of musical opportunities for youth in my community. I took the initiative by creating free accessible music program for grades three to eight on the fundamentals of reading music in 2020. I made exciting, engaging classes by incorporating all styles of learning. Kinetic by making musical instruments, visual by incorporating pictures to better understand the lesson, and auditory by creating your own rhythm to listen to the musical concepts. I was able to utilize technology to provide these lessons during the pandemic. And I successfully taught the fundamentals of reading music to seven students. My leadership educated youth in my community and fostered accessibility. Taking a leap of courage has shaped me into a confident, resilient individual ready to tackle bigger issues. And honestly, if it wasn't for COVID, I don't think I would be bold enough to do something completely on my own. But through this pandemic, I learned to take action now as we just don't know what the future or even tomorrow will bring. I learned that making a difference is not rocket science. It can be simply delivering groceries to vulnerable members of the community which can create lasting relationships and a positive impact within the community. The most important lesson I've learned from the pandemic is how valuable technology can serve us. If it were not for technology, I would not have the opportunity to speak here today, connect with friends and family across the world, or have the chance to make a virtual music program, or even continue cadets. I've been able to foster relationships with people I made across the world by participating in global youth conferences, virtual exchanges through Experience Canada, and an entrepreneurship camp where my team and I are creating a startup to connect fitness trainers to high school students, to motivate them to reach their health goals. Positively using technology has given me the opportunity to network with industry professionals and receive valuable advice as I move into adulthood and into higher education. Being able to hear different perspectives from mentors has inspired me to become the best version of myself. And thanks to technology, I've been positively impacted by my mentors and in return, impacting youth and high school students in my virtual community. Lastly, I learned how critical it is for everyone to do their part. Just like battling this pandemic, we all have to do our part to overcome racism. We have a lot to overcome, but it is not too late. The inequality disadvantaged groups face day to day has to end. And this starts with you, me, 
and our family and friends. Acknowledging the many forms of racism, supporting others, educating ourselves and others to commit to anti-racism is essential to fight the inequality minorities face in the workforce, school, media, shops, or even walking in public. We need to strive for equality for our family and friends to get to where we all need to be. And no, like most people, this journey was not easy. There were many hard days and tears shed. What I thought would be weeks turned into months and now over a year into battling this pandemic. This year is not over, this pandemic is not over, and my life is not over. I have so much more to grow and discover about myself. But through the pandemic, I've learned that overcoming obstacles is a part of life and taking a break for myself is necessary. And with technology, I can take initiative to positively impact the community. And that by uniting together, we can accomplish something bigger. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker Six. You can stay in the main meeting room for the last speech and we'll give the judges a few minutes. Thank you, sir. Speaker seven, are you ready? Yes, I am. I'm just going to pin the timekeeper quickly. Sure, sure. Okay, I am ready to go. Okay, so we have speaker seven. Topic is Cadet Choice, Canadian Innovations in World War One. Uh, Cadet Choice, Canadian Innovations in World War One. Speaker seven. Canada has long been a country based on science and technology ranging from natural resource extraction to academic research. The draft in World War I meant that men from all different backgrounds were sent to Europe. Many of these men were engineers and, and technicians, and they took their skills and, and knowledge with them to the war. But how useful could these skills actually be in a military context? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please sit back and enjoy while I tell you some incredible stories of how Canadians use their civilian skills to support the Allies in their fight to win the war. Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton was an engineering professor at McGill University. He used his knowledge from that university to develop scientific gunnery. This technique took into account meteorological conditions and barrel wear when aiming artillery. It used flash spotting and sound ranging to determine the position of enemy gunners. This improved counter-battery fire and artillery fire in general. This gave the Allied troops a break from the constant enemy bombardments that were a staple of World War I life. By, the late, by late 1918, as a 31-year-old Brigadier General, he, commit, he commanded the entire heavy artillery and counter-battery forces of the Canadian Corps. He's an exceptional example of how Canadians use their knowledge and skills from, from civilian life to improve the Canadian military's technology and tactics. Dr. Clooney McPherson, who studied at Methodist College in St. John's and McGill University, joined the Newfoundland Regiment at the outbreak of World War I. He served in France, Belgium, Egypt, and was later transferred to Gallipoli. There, he acted as an advisor on poison gas. In Gallipoli, the Allies were worried that Germany would use poison gas just as they had on the Western Front of Europe. McPherson used a German helmet to fashion a canvas hood with transparent eyepieces that were treated with chlorine absorbing chemicals. Dr. Clooney McPherson had just invented the world's first gas mask. His concept is now used by millions of military troops around the world and has saved countless lives. Railways have always been important in Canada. One of Sir John A. Macdonald's first goals for the country was to have a railway stretching from coast to coast. Railways were just as important on the Western Front of World War I. With the need to move people, equipment, and munitions hundreds of kilometers, railways were the best solution. However, enemy artillery could very easily destroy them, halting transport. They also took a very long time to rebuild and didn't always go to the places you needed them. This caused the development of the light railway system, 
that could quickly be built when old railways were destroyed. The Canadian Corps was an early adapter of the light railways because of the abundance of highly skilled railway workers from Canada. In April 1916, the Canadians organized the Composite Pioneer Company, mostly made of experienced railway workers, to focus just on the light railway system. Canada had a unique advantage when it came to railways because it was a young nation that had just recently built a massive railway system across its country. After just six months, the Composite Pioneer Company had increased the length of the light railway system by four times. Over a seven day period in July 1917, over 38,000 tons of munitions were transported. That's equivalent to 19,000 elephants, a truly incredible feat by the Canadians. These stories of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton, Dr. Clooney McPherson, and the Composite Pioneer Company are all examples of Canadians applying their peacetime expertise to military problems in the extreme challenges of war. This has left a legacy of innovation and advancement that lives on today. Whether it be Dr. Clooney McPherson or Chris Hadfield, Canada has always had great leaders in science and technology. The most impressive part of all of these stories, at least to me, is that they show how effectively Canadians took what they knew and used it to protect their friends, family, and fellow Canadians. I can only imagine how great our world would be if every one of us took our skills and focused just a little bit of that knowledge into being a benefit to society. As you leave this composition, competition today, I would like you to ask yourself this. How can I use my skills to make a difference in the world? Thanks, Speaker Seven. Thank you. So that was the last prepared speech. So we'll give the judges a few minutes, but let's take a little bit of a break but, uh, between now and when the impromptu speeches start. So it's 2.07 right now. Let's meet again in about 10 minutes, and then we'll start the impromptu speeches at that time. So I'll see you all then. For the impromptu speeches, uh, it'll be in reverse order. So we'll start with speaker number seven and then go up to speaker number one. And just a reminder to the judges that the speaker number for every cadet stays the same. So the first marking rubric will be for speaker number seven. Um, so what we'll do for the impromptu speeches is all the speakers will go back to the same breakout room as before. Or sorry, they'll go to a breakout room, but it's, uh, I think, different than before. And then before the impromptu speeches uh, start for that cadet, they'll be moved to a different breakout room where they'll, where they'll be given the topic. Then their three minutes preparation time will begin, and then they'll be moved to this main room where they can present their speech. Any questions for cadets on that? Uh, just a few reminders that uh, for these impromptu speeches, there's no electronics allowed, so no computers apart from this Zoom call and no phones for help, no external help if someone's on this call in the same house as you. Um, and make sure to keep the webcam on for the three minute preparation time and while you're presenting here. Okay, so for the attendees, what's happening right now is speaker number seven has moved into the three minute preparation room. Uh, so he's working on his speech right now and he'll join us in about three minutes. The topic for today's impromptu speeches is where do you see yourself in 10 years? So that's a topic that all the cadets will be presenting about. And we trust that even if you're in the same household or can contact the cadets that you won't, just to give all the cadets an equal three minute preparation time. Okay, speaker number seven, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, you can start anytime. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever had a dream? I'm sure you have, most of us have, whether it be in our childhood or into our teenage years, even into adults, all of us think about the future and, and dream about what could be possibly true. 
the topic I was given today is where do I see myself in 10 years? And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. I have always had a goal of joining the Canadian Armed Forces. Since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to be out in the world making a positive impact. So I see myself in 10 years is probably living on somewhere on the uh, East Coast. I want to be a air, uh, air combat systems officer. So I'll be working with the Navy. I'll get to sail all around the world. I get to see the world. And at the same time, I'll be helping others and making the world a better place. That's always been my goal. That's always where I see myself doing is helping others. I've also always had an interest in economics. I know, right? It's most people don't find that very interesting. In fact, most people find it quite boring. But for me, I've always been fascinated. I've always been fascinated in how people make choices. What do they choose to do with their money? What, how do those choices affect other people? How do those choices affect the economy as a whole? It's all about choices. And it's all about decisions that people make. And that's always been extremely fascinating to me. So I see myself maybe not being an economist or being in any sort of formal uh, job with the economy, but I always want to be learning and growing my knowledge of economics because it really is important, ladies and gentlemen. It really is important that we all understand it. And if I can learn it myself, then I can teach it to other people, talk to my kids about it, talk to my friends about it, and educate other people on how the economy works and how we can change it and make it better. I have also, I've also always been extremely fascinated in classical art. I know I probably don't look like someone who's very interested in classical art, but I've always been very interested in it. I find it beautiful. I find the techniques that, that artists like uh, Vermeer or Bernoulli can use to create their sculpture, create their paintings to be just a truly great feat of humanity. And I've always found that absolutely incredible. So that's the kind of things that I'd like to be doing. I'd like to be, uh, I'd like to be working with the Canadian Armed Forces. I'd like to be studying economics, and I'd like to be, hopefully, traveling around the world and seeing all the great art around the world. We are often told to give up our dreams. We're told to push them to the side, to not think about it. And maybe our dreams are unreasonable, but keep them in the back of your head. Keep thinking about it. Don't forget about it, because that will lead you to where you're supposed to be in your life. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Speaker Seven. And we'll give the judges a few minutes. Okay, Speaker number six, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, you can go anytime. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Flight Sergeant Kwan, and today I'll be sharing where I see myself in 10 years. In 10 years, I see myself graduating out of medical school and working as a pediatrician to help youth around the world. I aspire to volunteer with Doctors Without Borders to serve disadvantaged youth around the world. And this is because my passion is working with children. And throughout my life, I have had the opportunity to serve in different countries, such as the Dominican Republic, to serve the youth to teach English as a second language. And I also worked as a summer camp counselor three summers in a row as a camp counselor, lifeguard, worship leader, and activity leader. And through these experiences, I found my passion of working with children and my love for applying science and together I aspired to be a pediatrician and serve with Doctors Without Borders. And I also see myself traveling around the world because something that I love to do is travel and explore different cultures and different experiences while meeting new people. And I had lots of opportunities to travel so far, but I want to travel in every country that I possibly can. And in 10 years, I also want to run my first marathon and skydive and do a lot of my bucket list items to accomplish something bigger. And so in conclusion, in 10 years, I see myself being as a pediatrician, traveling around the world to help youth in the field of healthcare and 
doing things like doing things that I love to do, such as traveling, running, and skydiving. Thank you. Okay, thank you, speaker six. We'll give the judges a few minutes and speaker five is currently preparing, uh, is currently in the three minute preparation period. Speaker five, are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Okay, you can start anytime. Time okay. So when being asked where I'll be in 10 years, I don't know. I've barely got my next years in high school planned out. I will be 25 turning 26. I hope I'll have high school done, assuming I don't fail any of my classes, but I'm sure by that age, I'll be good and past all my classes. University or college? probably making working on it or I'll be done the, my two career choices currently is either be a crime scene detective because I have a love for crime currently which I don't know if I'll have in the future so then I have an interior designer as a backup plan which is just like designing rooms and all that having the right measurements which I'm not a fan of math so that may propose a problem in the future um, I want to be focused on my career for the next few years, like work hard and have my goals set out, um, possibly have my career started, depending on college and university and this whole pandemic, assuming it doesn't get any worse in the next 10 years, which we can hope it doesn't because that would be unfortunate and very problematic for the next generations coming in and out. I hope to have traveled a bit of the world before I settle down and work at my career like very full time. The I have a few countries that I want to travel to. Well, three being Sweden because Sweden is a pretty cool country. I pretty I don't know. Looking at pictures, I found it looks really amazing. Greece because. It's in ruins. It's going to be not there very soon, probably, knowing how this whole world is shifting. And the U.S. Hopefully it's not in chaos like it currently is. But not all of U.S., just like a few kind, few states. If, um, I'm not sure which states, but figure that out in the future. I hope to having a traveling partner, whether we're in a dating relationship or we're getting married it doesn't matter I just want a travel buddy like someone I can travel with someone who understands how I feel and that is where I hope to be for the next 10 years all my life okay thank you speaker five and we'll give the judges a few minutes Okay, all the judges are done. So speaker four, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, you can start anytime. Once again, good afternoon, honorable judges, officers, cadets, and guests. I'm Warren Officer First Class, Catherine Britanni, with 542 Foam Lake. Where do I see myself in 10 years? Is a wonderful question. In 10 years, I will be 28, which seems really old to me now, even though I know that it's not. <laughs> and had I been asked this question a year ago, I probably would have had a very different answer. In 10 years, I want to see, I want to be working in a library. I want to share stories and the traditions that those stories hold with the people around me. I think that working in a school and in a library would be a fantastic opportunity for this, as I would be working with the youth of Canada, as well as people who enjoy reading. <laughs> I hope to have finished a degree. And finally, I want to be giving back to the people around me. 
in 10 years, I hope to be a civilian instructor with cadets. I've learned so much from this program and been given so many opportunities. I hope to give back um, those opportunities to the next generation and include them in the wonderful program that is cadets. Um, like te through teaching and mentorship and with the summer camps. In 10 years, I hope to have a dog because I really enjoy dogs. And um, in 10 years, I hope to be able to travel. That is, that is one thing that we definitely had less of this year, to travel to see family and to see many destinations around the globe. So in closing, I hope to be working in a library, hopefully in a school. I hope to have a degree and I hope to be working as a CI with cadets. Thank you. Okay, thank you, speaker four. We'll give the judges a few minutes and speaker number three is currently in the preparation room. Speaker number three, are you ready? Uh, I just wanna pin the timekeeper. Uh, yep, I okay, think I'm ready. Okay, you can go anytime. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, judges, parents, and fellow cadets. I'm Flight Corporal Perthy Shaw. 10 years from now. That's a long time. That's a decade. I don't even know what I'm going to do after the competition more than 10 years from now. But one thing I know for sure is that I'll have a good university's degree. I'm only in grade nine. I'm only 14 years old. So I'm not really sure what I, what I want to be yet. But one thing I for sure know is that I want a degree that I can become financially stable on for the rest of my life. Right now, I'm thinking of something in the health science field, such as a pharmacist, because I love to help people. And for me, a pharmacist, I feel like is one of the main things that I can be to help people because they require medicine and medicine helps to treat people. By the time I'm 24, I'm hoping to get a nice big house and nice car, just so that it's easier to travel wherever I want within the city, maybe out, and I have a place to live. And third, I love to travel. Me and my family have traveled so much since the past years. We've been to USA, UK, France, and even countries like India. In 10 years, I'm hoping to travel even more. Places like Switzerland, Italy and Australia are in my bucket list. I would love to go to those places and see the lifestyles of their of them. And even after 10 years, I want to travel more. If I had the option to travel the world as my full time full time job, I would definitely do it because I love to travel. Traveling is basically my life. And one other thing I want to do is help others. I'm very fortunate to have a house, car, a loving family, education, health care, anything I can ask for. Lots of people don't. I want to start helping people and do something so then they can at least have food in their stomach. So 10 years from now, that's a long, long time. But a couple things I want to do and hopefully achieve is getting a good degree, travel a lot, and get a house. Hopefully there's more. Okay, thank you, speaker three. We'll give the judges a few minutes. Okay, speaker two, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, you can start anytime. Okay. Future is a very broad topic, but what if you limit the time from 60 years to 10 years, what would you see in yourself in 10 years? First, I would see myself as a psychologist, which is my biggest dream to proceed. 
In schools today, I've been trying so hard to work to become a psychologist, whether it's the only subject or other just or other subjects. Many people have different dreams, but mine is to become a psychologist. Second, I would see myself working in the military. My other dream is to work as a psychologist in the military, and I'm trying my best to get into the RMC, which the which is the Royal Military College, to get into the ROTP program after I got into the college. And my third dream is to try to save money. Many people may think that when you're, you know, when you are like 28 and you have a lot of money since you got work. But for me, I think no matter what age you're at, you should save money because you don't know what is going to happen. You know, you don't know what the future is. Maybe in 20 years, maybe you will go broke if you don't save, or maybe you will lose your job in 10 years. But the thing is, you need to have the right attitude for the future, no matter how many years there are, whether it's 10, 20, or 30. Attitude is very important in chasing dreams and for the future. Never be afraid to try new things. And life is too short to waste a second. You will never be bored or be boring because you're always learning. And that's what I will do for the next 10 years. Okay, thank you, Speaker Two. Thank you. We'll give, the, yeah, we'll give the judges a few minutes and Speaker One is in the preparation room. Speaker One, are you ready? Yes. Okay, you can start anytime. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have been wondering for a while now, where would I be in the future? It has been a question that has been plaguing me for a while. At night, before I fall asleep, this question roams in circles around my head, and it leaves me wondering. I have so much endless possibilities on what I can do in my future. So I set a time limit for myself. And then I decided that what would I like to see myself or where would I like to see myself in 10 years? So first in the next four years, I will be in high school and I will be completing it and getting ready for adulthood when I enter university. And then I will progress through high school, make new friends, you know, earn more experience with interacting with this huge, vast world that I'm going to be stepping in very soon. And afterwards, once I have finished high school, I will be going to university, hopefully. And for that, I have a list of universities that I would really like to attend. And at the top of that is Oxford University. I've always had a dream of being there. And who knows, maybe I actually will one day. And so then after in 10 years total time, if we fast forward, I will be 23 and I will hopefully be done university or finishing it up. And by that time, I hopefully would like to have a job in three major fields that I've always been interested in, either working for the military or doing something that has computer sciences involved or even medicine. With the military, I've always been passionate about helping others so that I am able to satisfy myself with the fact that I was actually able to make an impact. For computer sciences, I've always had a love for computers and how they work and how they were made and all of that. It's amazing. It's fascinating to me. And for medicine, it would be the same reason as in the military so that I would be able to help people. But I would also like to work for the emergency services because I've always wanted to know what it's like to be working there. And that is my whole vision for myself. 
and where I shall be hopefully in a span of 10 years. Okay, thank you, speaker one. So that's the end of all the speeches. So all the competitors can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> and now, so to what, what'll be happening now is all the judges will be sending uh, their marking rubrics to Leslie, who's the organizer today. She'll be compiling the scores and we'll be announcing uh, the top three cadets um, in a little bit. So now, since we have some time, uh, let's get to know the cadets a little bit. Maybe if you can rename yourself to your actual name uh, so we know who you are. And then maybe we can have you introduce yourself, uh, your name, your squadron, um, maybe if you've participated in effective speaking before and mention uh, what's an upcoming summer camp that you'd really like to go to after COVID. We can start with speaker one. Okay, perfect. Yeah, speaker one, if you want to just introduce yourself. All right. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nabiha Shaquille, and I am a leading air cadet at 574 Dakota Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. And this is my second year in the cadet squadron and my first time ever competing in effective speaking. And so far, I'm really enjoying it. That's great. So I'm assuming you haven't participated in a summer course yet, or have you? No, not yet. What's what's one that you're looking forward to, if you have a favorite? I mean, I don't really have a favorite yet. I'm hoping okay. I'll have one soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, speaker two. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Yanzi Han, and I'm a, star a flight sergeant from 34 Roland J. Groom in Regina, Saskatchewan. And I've been cadet for four years. And um, and my favorite camp that I would like to attend this, uh, after COVID is survival instructor. And I'm assuming you I'm assuming you've been to summer camps before. Yes, yes, sir. What was your favorite that you've been to? Uh, what I've been to is probably basic survival because you know I always have a passion in you know in the forest and the survival stuff things. And have you participated in effective speaking before? Uh, no, no. Uh, this is my first time, sir. Okay, well, that's great to hear. And speaker three. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Parthi Shaw, and I'm from 107 Spitfire Squadron in Saskatoon. This is my second year competing in effective speaking, so it's always great to be back. And uh, the camp I'm looking forward to are is either going to be my glider or power pilot course. Hopefully I got I get to go. And if not, the International Air Cadet Exchange. And have you been to a summer camp before? Yeah, I my first camp was GT because last year camps got canceled and I've enjoyed it so far. Right. So it's well, very memorable. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, speaker four. Hello, I am Catherine Batani. I'm a warrant officer first class with uh, 542 Foam Lake. And I've done effective speaking every year with my squadron as at our squadron level, it is encouraged that all cadets participate. This year was a little bit different because everything's a little bit different. Uh, camps, my two favorite have definitely been advanced aerospace and aircraft maintenance. They were both fantastic courses and I definitely enjoyed them. Uh, this will be my last summer in cadets and I'm hoping to have a staff position online. That's great, and Advanced Aerospace is in Quebec, right? Yes, it is. Advanced Aerospace is in Quebec and Air Maintenance was in Ontario. Yeah, okay, I, I've been to that course and it's, it's a great experience. It is fantastic. Uh, speaker five. So, hi, I'm Abigail Lewis. I'm from 624 Tisdale. Um, I'm currently a flight corporal. 
I've gone to one camp so far, and that's been GT, which was a pretty cool experience because I had a lot of people I knew from my squadron attend with me. Um, future camps. I applied for advanced aviation this year so I can work because I've been working on my glider slash pilot right now with a group from my squadron and another squadron. This is my third year, I think, in effective speaking. I'm not too sure. I was one of the first people who wanted to do this. So we started it in my squadron because I wanted to do it. Well, that's great. So it, do, you, uh, do you find that more people in your squadron are now participating in effective speaking? Mm, this year, I was the only one who wanted to do it. Um, we've had the same few people do it, but it's only been like five of us, I think. Not many people, but still enough to do it. Yeah, for sure. And I know some squadrons like to do it as a mandatory activity. Some squadrons like to do it as an optional activity. And I've seen some very small squadrons where everyone's participating. And I've seen some large squadrons where only one participant, one person's participating. So hopefully, hopefully the participation increases in the future. Yeah. Uh, speaker six. Hello, everyone. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Christine Kwan. I'm flight sergeant at 41 Hercules in Regina. This is my second year and my second year in effective speaking as well. And I was hoping to go for my power license, but unfortunately it was canceled. So I'm hoping to be a music staff cadet or a fitness instructor or a cadet advisory council this summer. That's great. And is that available this year or in future years when hopefully we have in-person courses? Sorry, I couldn't mute. Um, yeah. yeah, so the fitness, music, and the Cadet Advisory Council, they're all offered this summer online. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. And lastly, speaker seven. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Sergeant Mark Shields. I'm with 605 Terry Squadron in Swift Current. Um, I've only been in the Cadet program for three years. So, uh, my first year, I went to basic journal ceremonial, and then last year, of course, COVID happened, so uh, cadet, cadet summer training activities were canceled. And this year, I was trying to go to advanced aerospace uh, or survival instructor, but as we all know, uh, summer training courses were canceled. Um, but that's what I'd like to go to in the future would be those two courses, hopefully, or a staff cadet. I'd really like to be a staff cadet, yeah. Nice. And as staff cadet, do you have a preference for location, for camps uh, that you like? Ooh, location. Well, the, the course that I'd like to do would be a drill course because I'm a drill nut. I really like drill. Um, but location would probably be somewhere out east because I've never been that far out east. So I'd like to go and check it out. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So, sorry, raise your hand if you've participated in effective speaking before. Okay. And keep your hand up if you've been to selection boards for any camps or warrant officer boards or anything like that. Okay. Two people. So, Speaker four and six, do you find that effective speaking has helped for those interviews? For sure. I think so. I absolutely think that they feed off each other. So with the selection boards, you're asked questions and you you need to know your stuff. You need to know your facts. Uh, but then you're also asked your personal questions, which are kind of like mini impromptus. You have to come up with a logical answer. So it definitely... Um, when you practice one, you're practicing the other. Yeah, definitely. And just as general feedback uh, for us, um, for this competition, do you have any feedback on how we can improve it for next weekend for provincials? I, I just wanted to say that I was, I've, I've done some zoom sort of competition type stuff before and it's gone very badly but this went quite well i was actually very impressed with how it went so thank you very much the way it was a good competition i think yeah that's great to hear thanks to our tech support person 
Michelle, it went smoothly. Any other feedback or it went relatively smoothly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I echo what Mark said and I think it really went smoothly considering that we're doing it in a virtual platform. And it's really nice to have this opportunity to get to do competitions, so thank you. And for people that have participated in in-person competitions, how does this virtual format compare to in-person? Is it easier or, uh, yeah. Um, I would say in-person was quite harder for me because uh, everybody can physically see you and your expressions and your body movement versus virtually I only got to see the timekeeper and just like two people on the top of my screen. So it, it was quite less, I would say, nervousness compared to in-person. I, I prefer in-person because here I'm just staring at my camera lens, right? I couldn't make eye contact with any in the room. I couldn't like in my impromptu. You said that you didn't like the expression, but I like it because it, it, it kind of lets me feel how the audience is enjoying it and whether I need to keep pushing that type of a speech or if I need to transition to a more serious or funny or, or where to go. So I, I felt it was weird just staring at my camera whereas I couldn't transition or look at different people. Um, but this was fine too, this was still good. Yeah, well, uh, congrats to everyone on those speeches. Um, as a former competitor in effective speaking, I know that it's not easy, especially if it's your first time. It's not easy preparing uh, for your prepared speech, and it's not easy in the three-minute time period to prepare for your impromptu, especially because the topic can be pretty much anything. So great job on all that. Now I'll just switch over to actually talking about the judges. I don't think we've been able to see them yet, uh, but judge one, two, and three, if you can just turn on your webcam and maybe say hi, so we know what you look like. Good afternoon. And the evaluator, we have four people today. Okay, so I'll talk about judge one first. I'll just introduce him a bit, so we know uh, a little bit of background. So judge one is Jeremy Schmidt. Uh, he was born and raised in Saskatchewan, and he's currently a lieutenant with the cadet program. Uh, he says he owes a lot to the cadet program, and he loves giving back where he can. Um, his cadet career started in 1990 uh, when he joined 863 Northern Lakes Air Cadets in Glassland, Saskatchewan. Then he moved to Shaunavan in 1996 and joined 248 Golden Eagle Air Cadets, where he aged out and then started his officer career. Then he moved to Saskatoon in 1999 and joined 107 Spitfire Air Cadet Squadron, which is my former Air Cadet Squadron. <laughs> and then he moved in 2002 to Brandon, Manitoba and joined 82 Brandon Air Cadets. Uh, and then he, after spending three and a half years helping 60 Swiftshire Sea Cadets for a year, he, held, he settled down with 2502 Shiloh 1 RCHA Army Cadet Corps. Um, as a cadet, he spent many years in Penhold and CFB Cold Lake at cadet camps as cadet staff and two years as basic flight commander in Penhold. And in his full-time life, he works at Prairie Mobile Communications as a two-way radio consultant. He enjoys spending time outdoors, capping with his kids and watching Saskatchewan Rough Rider games. Uh, so thanks, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Uh, for judge number two, we have uh, Kathy Stokes. Maybe you wanna just say hi. You're, on, you're just on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. So Kathy is a voice coach, a choral coordinator, adjudicator, clinician, a star search judge, and music teacher. Uh, she's devoted much of her career to promoting youth through music and the speech arts. Uh, her award-winning choirs have performed on both the national and international stage. Uh, she's, she's been the past president of the Saskatchewan Choral Federation, past president of the Potashville Music Festival Association, and a founding member of the Easter Hazy Arts Council. In 2016, she was nominated for a Saskatchewan YMCA Woman of Distinction Award for her work in the arts. For the past 10 years, Kathy has attended the National Air Cadet League Effective Speaking Competitions. 
and she uh, appreciates the hard work and commitment required to prepare for the competition and congratulates each and every one of you today. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. And judge number three is Leanne Boosfeld. Hello, everybody. Familiar faces, not so familiar faces. It's nice to see everybody today. Yeah, so Leanne is a former warrant officer second class and drum major from 41 Hercules Air Cadet Squadron in Regina. Uh, her biggest accomplishment in the Air Cadet program was building a band from one cadet to 13 marching cadet band members. She then went on to the University of Regina, where she is currently studying creative writing in the English Major Arts program. Her extracurricular activities in cadets taught her the skills she needed to move forward with courage and certainty. She's currently the provincial music director for the Saskatchewan Air Cadet League. Thanks, Leanne. And then we also have an evaluator. Hi, how's it going? Hi, Damon. Uh, so Damon Bradley Jang is a former warrant officer second class who started at 759 Falcon Squadron in Burnaby, but then he transferred to 754 Phoenix Squadron in BC. Uh, he attended the senior leadership course in 20, 2002 and was Albert Head staff in 2004. He was the former NCOIC of instruction at his squadron and was invited to attend a senior non-commissioned officer training course when he was still a corporal. After he, after he aged out in 2004, he shifted his focus to his other passion of performing arts and utilized the skills he learned in cadets in running his own theater company and as a freelance performing arts teacher. And from an artist's point of view, Damon is a multifaceted performing artist, instructor and publicist from Vancouver. He holds a, bachelor, he holds a bachelor's degree in performing arts and musical theater diploma from Capilano University. He's also trained in intensives at Banff Art Center in Alberta, Broadway Dance Center in New York City, and Harbor Dance Center in Vancouver. As a performer, he most recently swung in a replacement to, place, to play Pepper in Mamma Mia, with Fraser Valley stage after four rehearsals. He works often as a choreographer and or director in companies around Metro Vancouver, and is currently the co-artistic and marketing director of Fabulous Theater and highlights include the Vancouver premiere of Once on this Island for which he won the Broadway World Vancouver Award for best direction and choreography. Thanks, Damon. Uh, Michelle, do we have any update on the scores? Do you know how long it'll take? Okay, we got the message that it's five minutes. Sorry, Damon, you were going to say something. Oh yeah, I, I was just going to say Leslie asked me to um, like just take some like general notes, so I I have general notes. If you sure, let's go through that. Time. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so you guys, um, great job. It's been a long time since I've been involved in the Air Cadet program, but as they say, uh, you can take a person out of Air Cadets, but you can't take Air Cadets out of a person. Uh, so I aged out um, before most of you were born, so that uh, that's, that's totally okay. Uh, I feel like a young old person, but um, yeah. So, in fact, speaking, I, I got a chance to go to um, SLC or senior leadership course before it was taken away and the programs kind of changed a bit. So um, yeah, uh, one of the biggest things that I kind of took away from, from all of your speeches that I utilize now a lot in, in acting training and like theater training. And I use a lot of the skills that I've learned in air cadets plus with my performing arts skills to like work with a lot of different, um, with a lot of different speakers on how to speak and how to speak, uh, speak properly and, and different um, people who might not end up being in the performing arts, but utilizing the skills in the perform like of performing arts as a, a marketing tool just to be uh, better well-rounded humans. And um, some of the things that I took away from that was your uh, understanding of pacing. So making sure that some of you were really, really good with your prepared speeches and just understanding your inflection, where to put your pauses in, how to make things really engaging. Some people uh, were a little more formulaic, formulaic and, and read your speeches as if it was like just 
reading a bunch of factual information, which isn't necessarily bad. It just means that eventually you'll get into a bit of a flow where there is a little bit of different inflection in your voice and there's and there's pauses and there's uh, a natural pacing to your voice so that when the speaker is listening to you, remember that this is the first time that people are hearing the information that you're speaking. So you want to make sure that the information lands so that it affects them, you know, that's why it's called effective speaking, and it affects them in a way that the information resonates with them. Uh, yes, some of you took a little bit, of, uh, little bit to get into a, a natural pacing. Uh, one thing that I, I like to tell people is to avoid dropping the ends of your sentences. So making sure that the, your breath support, and, and Kathy as a, as a voice teacher and uh, will, will probably um, have the same kind of thinking that when you are breathing, if you're staggered breathing, just try to make sure that you find a natural place to breathe so we're not hearing like an audible, right? So it's like, as you're going through your, your, your speech pacing, you want to just make sure you're finding a way to like naturally take a breath without having to do a, a big audible breath in the middle. And one way is just to like open your mouth and just do a quick breath on the natural breaks of, of a speech pattern to make it flow a little bit more naturally. Uh, tone and inflection really helps illustrate dialogue, and it really helps the listeners illustrate things in their mind. Painting audio images can be a really effective way of transferring information. Eyeline is really important too, making sure you understand where you're looking at. I know that, you know, again, in the parameters of Zoom, it's really difficult uh, because you don't really know where to look and you don't have a live audience to kind of interact with. Uh, Thinking about your urgency and your intention. So breaking your speech up. I mean, I know that there's a formulaic way of going about creating your speeches uh, as per the, the kit handbook, but just an easy way that I, I approached speeches uh, in the past is to break it up into chunks and figure out what are my main points that I'm going to be thinking about and the subtext behind each of those points, and then really thinking about what is the how what is the overall theme that connects them together, and then what is the what is the point in each of these bodies of paragraphs uh, that I'm trying to hit in, in each of those segments. Um, thinking about the beats of your speech, breaking it up into your key points. So, you know, when you want to emphasize this point, when you want to emphasize that point. Uh, some of you uh, had a lot of really nice animation in your um, facial physicality. And uh, it was very obvious that, um, I, I have to say that, uh, Catherine and Christine, I really enjoyed the personal anecdotes of your speeches because for me, it wasn't really engaging just to hear your personal approaches to the subject matter. And I thought that that was really engaging because it, it was a, a good mix between factual information, uh, but also like personal testimony that was, uh, that really hit on, on, on emotional content. So I think that that was uh, a really a smart move. And I think that other speakers can can take a, a lesson from that, that anytime you're, you can add in any kind of personal testimony or any kind of like uh, emotional content into your speeches is always going to be more relatable and more authentic to the uh, to your speeches. Um, yeah, and then just in terms of it, it prompt you, uh, impromptu, just like anything else, like, you know, in, in improv uh, that we learn, it's just about thinking through, like, you only have three minutes, so you have to just go with your gut instinct and just be natural, be authentic and show your personality. Because uh, especially with the with uh, Mark, I, I saw more of your personality and your passion come through in your impromptu speech when you were talking about uh, what you wanted to do in, in 10 years, um, a little bit more and I saw your prepared speech, not that it was uh, good and the information wasn't good. I just saw a lot more of your personality and your passion from your impromptu speech. So that's a really good indicator that you should try to allow the passion and flow and uh, consistency of your impromptu speech to permeate within your prepared speech as well too. And then on the flip side, some of you had really amazing prepared speeches but then as soon as you had to go into an impromptu speech, it was more, you were thinking about it and there was, there was a less of a natural flow to it. So on the opposite side, if you prepare something so well 
that the improv is a little weak, that's the kind of thing that you want to make sure that you touch on. If your prepared speech is a little bit weaker and your improv game is really strong, uh, then uh, and then on the opposite, your improv uh, is uh, really is a little bit weaker, but your prepared speech is really good. Try to find a happy balance between the two of them. And uh, just as a as an end cap, I you know, um, Cadets has always been one of those programs. Like in the say, even though I'm not really involved in the Cadet program so much anymore. I can I can tell you even though completely different completely different fields. Uh, I use the skills that I learned in air cadets every single day in every single possible way in everything that I do. So uh, I'm so glad that you guys are still involved, and I love seeing the diversity of the different of different cadets in the program now, 17 years after I reached out. Awesome. Thanks, Damon. Yeah, thanks for your insight. That's, uh, I think that'll be really important uh, for all the cadets, whether they make it to the next stage or not, especially if they uh, keep participating and even if they're, even in their daily lives. Uh, now, we're ready to introduce the top three cadets. So for that, I'd like to introduce uh, Gary Gehring, who's the Saskatchewan Air Cadet Lead President, to uh, do the medal presentations and share some comments. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, for coming and participating today. Uh, what another great job by uh, all the today. That's, uh, I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, as Jay mentioned, my name is Gary Gehring. I'm the current chair for the league. Uh, I have messages that my internet connection is unstable so yeah gary i was just gonna say uh maybe uh do you have your video on maybe we, you can try disabling your video and maybe your audio will be more clear my uh, sorry uh, i'm not sure what happened on my end but uh that's a lot better we can hear you so clearly. i think I'll, okay great uh so i'm not sure where i dropped off but uh i was saying i, I like learning new things and i i certainly uh learned some new things today and reinforce some other thoughts i can all the the judges would have had their hands full again trying to decide uh, amongst our candidates i thought everyone uh, was winner they did very well and uh this is a, a great and important skill set, I think, that'll help in all their endeavors in the future. Uh, that's why I was asking Jay just uh, the overlap between selection boards and effective speaking uh, goes without saying. So I think, uh, you know, to your co cadets, if they sort of poo poo the effective speaking, you know, I don't really want to do that. But you say, well, do you want to go fly? Well, sure. Well, you know, you got to get through a selection board, which involves the same skill set. So it's a good, uh, a good pitch, I think, that they could all use. Um, uh, I notice it builds confidence and in turn leadership that you'll carry with you wherever you go. And so uh, I, I think that uh, this is a, a skill that everyone ha should continue to grow throughout their careers. So, uh, without further ado, I, uh, you know, we all uh, have to somehow select three participants to move to the next level, provincials. Today, I will uh, indicate that third, our third place uh, goes to uh, Mark Shields, Squadron 605. Congratulations. Our second place today uh, goes to Catherine Batiani, 
542. Congratulations. And our, our first place uh, goes to Christine Kwan, 41 in Regina. And congratulations to you as well. The three uh, top three speakers do receive medals as indicated. And, and also, all speakers will uh, receive a participant pin for their efforts today. And again, I think that uh, you're all winners uh, by participating in this. I want to thank the judges, uh, organizers, and volunteers for the exceptional job with the event. And on behalf of the Air Cadet League of Saskatchewan, I personally want to thank you for attending. And finally, uh, don't forget to support your squadrons and our league with our 50-50 draw, which is closing in 12 days, SKACL 50-50. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And then now I'd like to announce or introduce um, Leslie Bennett, who is the organizer for today's event. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I don't want to take up a, a lot of your time. Uh, I just want to congratulate all of uh, the cadets uh, for making it to zones. Uh, and to those of you um, moving on, congratulations. And uh, I know, uh, I mean, Gary and Jay have already uh, done a bunch of thank yous, but I really can't thank enough um, the cadets for your participation. Um, happy to see some guests um pop in to watch you because it's it's just a gift getting to listen to you all talk and i hope you all stick with the program um and really thank my judges um and my tech support jay the mc did a great job there uh always fell in time for me while i was trying to tabulate all those scores so uh and thanks damon um for your uh additions uh, i know the the kids can really benefit from those tips so um we'll let jay wind it down and then afterwards there's an opportunity for the cadets to go uh into breakout rooms one-on-one -on -one, uh with the judges if they can hang around and as well if damon can hang around um there'll be an opportunity there um for some one-on-one -on -one, uh advice as well thank you everyone go ahead jay okay thanks leslie and also we'd like to thank all the coaches and officers and judges parents and volunteers, and of course, all the cadets for making this uh, competition happen. And in addition to the three judges and the evaluator, we also have Sarah Riddell from 691 Indian Head volunteering in the impromptu room. We have Richard Petrowski who volunteered as a supervisor in the cadet room, and Trevor Bennett was the timekeeper. So thanks to everyone uh, from this event and before this event that made effective speaking happen today. Uh, so for all the cadets, congrats to those that made it to the next level and congrats to everyone else for participating uh, in this competition. And I highly suggest to keep participating, whether you made it to the next level or not. Um, and so now we can, this competition is done, but feel free to stay if you want some feedback from the judges one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, we can set up breakout rooms. Uh, thanks and have a great day.